afternoon. My name is Congressman Pete Olson. I represent the 22nd District of Texas and have the distinct honor of representing the home of U.S. human spaceflight, the Johnson Space Center. And I'm here today with some of my colleagues uh, to talk about what's going on with the President's budget. As you all know, it cancels the Constellation Project, terminates it unilaterally. A very, very bad decision for our country. Um, we've had numerous hearings last the past couple weeks with um, some of the principals involved in this, and we've still got unsatisfactory answers. And uh, there's much, much bipartisan opposition to the President's plan, and you're going to hear us about some of that today. And again, we appreciate y'all coming. Um, as you know, we sent a letter to um, the Administrator, General Bolden, this week asking him, what is Plan B? The current plan is to give, cancel the Constellation, replace it with these unproven commercial launch vehicles. In fact, one of them, if you've been following the news, had an accident during a test firing of its engine. Accident's probably about the too strong word, but had a, had a malfunction with you know, some flames coming out the side. And the administration wants to bet that our future in human spaceflight on unproven commercial private enterprise technologies. We've got an alternative. The Constellation is the program of record. It's been very successful in September, you all recall. It had a very successful test launch of the Ares 1X rocket. And just this past week, it passed its program design review, the PDR, which all of you know is a critical step towards going forward. Our country has sunk $9 billion in the development of the Constellation so far. Another $2.5 billion is a minimum that's estimated that we lose by canceling the contract and all the penalties we'll have to pay for that. Uh, the administration's decision to cancel the Constellation program is short-sighted and risks putting our country in the number two, three, four status, relinquishing our leadership in human space. And we should never, ever let that happen. Uh, what we've done as a delegation is earlier this week we sent a letter to General Bolden. Uh, of a NASA administrator and ask General Bolden to come up with some sort of alternative plan. I mean, right now we're betting it all on these commercial, private, unproven rocket capabilities. That's unacceptable for America. We will lose access, as all of you know, to the International Space Station, an incredible, incredible laboratory that the American taxpayer has paid the overwhelming majority of the cost. Again, billions and billions of dollars thrown down the drain if we don't maintain our access to the International Space Station. Um, we're going to have to buy, get it right now from the Russians, is the current plan. As all of you know, the Russians, um, say what you want about them, they're good capitalists. I mean, they figured out how that works. I mean, they would charge us just a little over $20 million last year to ferry our astronauts to and from the space station. That price has gone up now to $50 million, over $50 million, all over double. And we signed a contract to, through 2013. Right now, it's very doubtful that we're going to have a U.S. indigenous capability uh, at that 2013 time. So guess what our friends probably do? They'll probably up the price again once it comes up. Again, they figured it out. So the letter we sent to General Bolden said, you know, we need to come up with an alternative plan, something within the budget of NASA, the exploration budget, to keep our access to the space station in low Earth orbit. And I'm joined here by some of my colleagues who are fighting very hard for this. And with, uh, I'd like to introduce the chairman, or not, I'm looking ahead to the future, the ranking member of the Appropriations Secretary of Hales, NASA, Congressman Frank Wolf. Frank? Thank you, Pete. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, for the past 50 years, NASA has been an unending source of inspiration, innovation, and national pride for all Americans. Its achievement and exploration of manned spaceflight have rallied our nation in a way that no other federal program aside from our armed forces can. The administration proposal all but abdicates U.S. leadership in exploration of manned spaceflight. Other countries like China are turning to space programs to drive innovation and promote economic growth. Earlier this week, the China DLA reported that China is now accelerating their manned spaceflight development with the, while the U.S. cuts back. According to Bai Wen with the Chinese Academy of Science, he said the following, quote, a moon landing program is very necessary because it could drive the country's scientific and technological development. Manned space flight and exploration is one of the last remaining fields in which the U.S. maintains an undeniable competitive advantage over other nations. To walk away would be wrong. 
James Lewis with the Center of Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, said, quote, for the administration proposal is a confirmation of America's decline. And decline is a choice. A great nations make a choice whether they want to de de decline or not. We will be dependent on the Russians in the short term for rides to the International Space Station. And worse, we will be forced to play catch up to the Chinese and the Russians in the future. The editors of Space News argue that this could have a devastating effect on U.S. national security by undermining our propulsion base. Additionally, the administration proposal was surprising given the president's uh, repeated stations, statements with regard to American students pursuing degrees in math and science and physics and chemistry and biology to sort of bring about a renaissance in science for our nation and then to go this way. By forsaking NASA's exploration program, we will lose a key inspirational program that motivates young people to pursue de degrees. As noted in our letter, Space exploration has been the guiding star of American innovation. The Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, the shuttle programs rallied generations of Americans to devote their careers to science and engineering. We're asking uh, Administrator Bowden to allow the Space Center directors and others, and we put together some ideas of people, to bring together some of the very best minds, not Republican minds or Democratic minds, but some of the very best minds to look at this and to consider better alternatives within the allocation and report back within, uh, within uh, 30 days. Over the past several weeks, I've heard from, and all these letters are on my website, a number of Apollo astronauts and NASA leaders. Each believes that the administration plan is a bad idea. And lastly, notably, I received a letter from Bert Rortang, the X-Prize winner, who flew the first private commercial craft into space in 2004, who ardently opposes the budget proposal. He said, as an quote, an observer might think I would applaud a decision to turn this important responsibility over to commercial developers. However, he would be wrong. Two years after Neil and Buzz landed on the moon, America led the, led the world in awarding PhDs in science and engineering and math. Then he goes on to say, today we are not even the first or the, on the second page. The motivation of the youth is the most important thing we do for a nation's long-term security and prosperity. NASA's role in that can be as critical as it was in the 60s if the tax passed fund through research and exploration. Lastly, there was a letter that was just given to me. A group memorializing astronauts killed in the line of duty and their families have invoked their names in an effort to convince the Obama administration to drop its plan changes. And here's what they, they said. The Astronauts Memorial Foundation, an educational foundation honoring the 24 Americans killed during space missions, said ordering NASA's future would run counter to their sacrifice. They went on to say, and I'll just end with this, in order to honor those astronauts and their families who have sacrificed for all the benefits of human exploration and allow Americans continued pride in the space program, we urge you to vigorously support uninterrupted continuation of the U.S. space program. With that, I yield back to... Uh, Thank you, Frank, for those very precious comments. Again, terminating the Constellation program puts at risk, ends our dominance of human spaceflight. It destroys thousands of jobs, not just in my district and the districts that are affected with the NASA centers, but across the country. It has national security implications. And something you can't put a number on, and, and as Frank alluded to, the ability to inspire our youth to get into the math, science, engineering, those technology disciplines, the so-called STEM technology disciplines. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over again to Rob Bishop, Congressman from Utah, champion for the Constellation Program. Rob? Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate being here. Let me do two things. The first one is to maybe talk about vocabulary for just a second. Some people have said that this new NASA plan that has been administered is commercializing or privatizing the program. Nothing could be further from the truth. When I assume you privatize something, it means there are fewer government dollars, fewer government workers, and you come up with a better product. This plan actually spends more of taxpayers' money. It actually keeps the number of federal employees intact. It just fires private sector employees. It does not produce a better product. What it simply does is take contracts currently going to the private sector to produce Constellation, which is a proven quantity, and shifting that money to other previously selected private sector contracts to produce something that is not a proven quantity. 
So this is not privatization. This is simply the government once again picking winners and losers. And in this case, the NASA administrators have picked a loser over the winner. And that's wrong. That's simply wrong. I also want to give one other, the second thing, is a different connotation to what this means. Oftentimes, when we do naive and impulsive behaviors, there are unintended consequences. There are unintended consequences of this proposal that does not simply affect NASA and spaceflight. It also affects the military of this country. Now, I'm going to talk about the industrial base, which is our, our government speak, meaning that the kinds of people and the kinds of jobs that build a rocket to put a man on the moon are the same kinds of jobs and the same kinds of people who build missiles to defend this country. Last year, when we made a massive cut in our military defense, we put the industrial base in a quandary. This year, if we now cut Constellation, we will decimate the industrial base, which simply means that if we are underestimating the impact of countries like Iran and North Korea, and we destroy the industrial base, we will not have the capacity to, re to back up and build missiles to defend this particular country because we have lost the industrial base. The Pentagon has been very specific about that in three separate occasions over the last year. In April, they did a report on solid rocket motors they sent to Congress and simply said that if Constellation is slowed, not destroyed and, and limited, but slowed, it would have a negative impact on the ability of the defense to defend this country. In June, they did another survey, another report. They changed their mind. This time they said, if you slow down Constellation, it will have a significant negative impact on the ability to defend this country. In, in September uh, or October, I can't remember which one of these, Under Secretary for Acquisitions also sent us a letter in which he said, this industrial base is not a birthright. These are specific jobs and specific people. We do not have the ability within the Air Force to replicate that. We have, we have abandoned our missile defense production opportunities years ago. It's only to the private sector. He said in his report that if you will lose these, you may never get them back. These are not easily found in the commercial system. This is not a spigot you can turn off, on and off. If you lose this, you may not get it back, which is why when we ask Secretary Gates if he'd had discussions with NASA, he had not. We ask others if they'd had discussions with NASA on the impact to the military, they had not. Secretary of the Air Force told us simply, this is a problem they yet have a handle and they recognize that as a problem. So once again, if you make a naive and, and jump assumption that we can simply change what we're doing in Constellation, it has an unintended consequences that means we are less able to defend this country. The military is harmed if this plan goes through. And NASA did not. If they did do communications, they certainly weren't listening because what they have done has put us not just in harming our ability to control the space, and to control the heavens. But it's put us in an inability to defend ourselves if we underestimated some rogue countries like North Korea. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob, for those kind of comments. And Rob's comments sort of flow on one of the, the big problems with this plan by the administration is no one was included in, in the decision process outside of a small cabal, from what we can tell, in the White House. Uh, certainly not the Department of Defense. So not any members of, of Congress of the committees of jurisdiction. Certainly not the Senate directors. I talked to the Johnson Senate director on Tuesday. The, the news came out Monday. Asked him what he thought. You know, he's like, we're working hard to keep our morale up. We've got four missions to take care of on the shuttle. But, uh, you know, well, what do you think? is blindsided. Had no idea that, that was coming. Again, that's a fundamental problem, making a change, such a significant change in our human spaceflight program and not consulting the re elected representatives of the people, the experts who are involved in this process. And again, it's fundamentally wrong. Uh, I'd like to turn it over now to Congressman Michael McCall from the 10th, 10th District of Texas. Michael? Thanks, Pete. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'm Congressman Michael McCall. My district uh, uh, encompasses uh, Austin to the Houston suburbs, so a lot of my uh, constituents on the Houston end are NASA employees and contractors. I'm, I also serve with Pete on the uh, Space Subcommittee on the Science and Technology uh, Committee. Now, in the 1960s, President Kennedy envisioned uh, NASA and the mission to send a man to the moon and return him safely to the Earth. Uh, this greatly undermines that core principle and mission of NASA in, in, in the sense that it cuts the human spaceflight program. It kills the Constellation program. Um, it will set back our, our ability to explore space for many, many years. Um, 
at a time we can really least afford it. Um, <clears throat> I'm very concerned that we've invested so much in Constellation. Nine billion dollars will take two and a half billion dollars to uh, ramp it down. And at the same time, this administration, as it cuts human spaceflight, is redirecting funding towards climate change and weather observation. Is that really what NASA is going to be about now? Uh, you have to, you have, it causes me great concern. And I think Congressman Bishop talked about the national security aspects. We've always known that in the backdrop of the space race, that the military was a key component. I'm concerned that, that uh, the Russians and the Chinese now are going to go way ahead of us. And that English is not going to be the predominant language in space, but rather Russian and Chinese. Now, this has serious consequences for this nation moving forward, not only in spaceflight, but in, but in national security. I, I want to thank uh, Congressman Frank Wolf for his great leadership in getting this letter to the administrator who we questioned last week in a hearing uh, to come up with a team of 30 nonpartisan experts to review this, I think, this bad decision and to go to a plan B. But know that there are many of us in the Congress, and as we've alluded to in a very bipartisan way, who are going to stand up to this decision, uh, who are going to, to fight with everything we have uh, to restore that funding to the Constellation Program, uh, which is so vitally important to, to America. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for bringing up President Kennedy's speech because, you know, we all know that that speech, we're going to go to the moon by the end of this decade, inspired a generation, and we achieved it. That's one of the things when I go back home that is lacking with this plan. You have employees, contractors, wives, sons, daughters asking, what's our mission? What are we doing? What are we seeking? That's what NASA is. They are exploration, space exploration. This plan does nothing to advance that. And I'd like to just introduce now a congressman from the 29th District of Texas, good friend, good NASA supporter, Gene Green. Thank you, Pete. And I want to thank my colleagues for being here. This is a bipartisan effort. And uh, from Byron Mike McCall, and some of you may remember that we have had some discussion on the House floor about English only in our own country. I do agree that we ought to have English only on the moon. <laughs> so, uh, and that's really what we're talking about. And I have a district just north of Pete's, so I have very few NASA employees. But what it means, and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, uh, what it means to the school children in, in our country. But let me talk about this letter first. Uh, last week we understood that uh, Administrator Bolton said we need a plan B. And this letter is to encourage that because the administration cannot pass their plan through the House of Representatives. And that's what this letter and the number of letters, we have a full court press on this. I have two pages of actions that members of the House on a bipartisan basis who are doing to oppose what the administration decided to do. The biggest problem they have is that you cannot change authorizing law by budget. The president submits a budget. We in the House, we write our own budget. Now, it's passed on a very partisan basis. But you don't change that law by budget. There was a great authorization in 2005, another one in 2009 under Democratic control, 2005 under Republican, that grew this program. And you don't change that by budget. And you definitely don't change uh, appropriations. Appropriations are based on the authorization. And so our first battle is to see what matter if NASA is going to have a chance and the administrator and the administration to come up with a plan B. So we do keep the constellation. We do keep manned space travel. That's constellation and all the, uh, all the things that go with it. We need to do that because it's not going to pass the House of Representatives. So they ought to go back and bring us so we can do this cooperatively and bipartisanly. That's the thing. Let me uh, close by talking about the, the vision of NASA that literally started with John F. Kennedy. Because I was one of those school kids in 1960 that uh, remember what happened. And I remember in 1969 when we were on the moon. I was still in college then. But today I have the opportunity because I'm close enough to NASA. Every year we take an astronaut with us and go to middle schools. I have a majority Hispanic district in Houston, Texas and East Harris County. And to see those students, middle school kids, 6th, 7th and 8th graders, they won't pay attention to me or even Hispanic business folks that go in and talk about what they need to do to be successful. 
But when you take an astronaut there, whether Hispanic or Anglo, and they go in their jumpsuit and they talk about space, they talk about their experiences, or their science effort, those 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, and particularly in my minority schools, pay attention. I don't want to lose that hope. I don't lose that by saying, oh, we're going to do it, but we're going to do it by all these different contractors. We need to do it by the plan that was set out in 2005, that was enforced in 2008, and actually the appropriations bill said NASA cannot move that money without coming back to Congress. So, you know, all the things the administration's done, you might as well go back to the drawing board and do what this letter asks you for. Create those experts from the centers that, have, that NASA has and then come back to us because when we pass a budget, I can't vote for a budget if, that, if it has the administration's uh, stuff in there for NASA, if they have it in there also on the energy taxes, but that's a separate issue. But they don't pass it and it's a partisan vote. All of us Democrats need to vote for it because it'll be our budget, but I can't vote for it. It's not in there. So that's what the administration do. Listen to this letter and listen to the dozens of members of Congress who are asking you to come back with something that you can sell to the, uh, to the members of the House. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you for those kind of comments, Chief. And just to follow up on what he talked about, about the education, the ability to inspire our youth with the astronauts going out of the community. This past Monday, I was at Pan High School, a young lady named Hannah Gorse who was selected to participate in a program that's uh, jointly run with NASA in the state of Texas to develop interest in our young people in the, in the engineering discipline so they get into those fields. And she right now is taking the correspondence courses at home uh, just to show you what, you know, what she said. She said, you know, well, I've designed a CEV. And I thought, I mean, I knew what that was, but most of it just kind of goes blank. You know, she designed a crew exploration vehicle, basically a little rover. She's designed that in her house. She's designed components for the space station, for the space shuttle. A, an incredibly young woman, and she's going to get to spend six months, six days later this summer at the Johnson Space Center going around with people who are doing the job she wants to do, the aerospace space engineers. We can't forget NASA's and human space flight's ability to inspire youth. And with that, I'll turn it over to our final speaker, Congressman from the Seventh District. District of Texas, the Honorable John Carlson. Thank you very much. Thank Pete. you, John. Thank you very much. I serve on the House Appropriations Subcommittee for NASA, and I am here today with my friends from both sides of the aisle uh, to announce, as we, as you have heard, we uh, together have found a good compromise position which would allow the uh, Amer allow America to preserve our manned space program within the existing budget. We have asked NASA to tell us within 30 days how to uh, build a capsule. Build a heavy lift vehicle and have regular test flights out of the Kennedy Space Center within the existing exploration budget. We know the answer to that question will be favorable. We know that we can uh, preserve America's manned space program within the existing budget. This is a good compromise position from what the Obama administration has proposed. Gene Green is absolutely right. The administration will not pass their plan to surrender America's manned space program to the Chinese and the Russians through Congress. It's not going to happen. America has never surrendered her leadership role. We have never s surrendered the high ground. What the administration is proposing is surrendering the high ground of the 21st century in the same way that the uh, Union Army preserved and protected the high ground in Gettysburg. Just imagine if General Meade, just imagine if General Meade at Gettysburg had voluntarily surrendered Little Round Top or given up Cemetery Hill. We do not ever surrender the high ground as Americans to any other nation. And the administration will not pass their plan to surrender the high ground of outer space through Congress. And we are united, both Republicans and Democrats, in our determination to preserve and protect the magnificent uh, manned space program that has been developed over 50 years. The, the scientists, the engineers, the astronauts at NASA uh, are heroes. We're immensely proud of them and the spark of inspiration they light in the hearts of every American and in particular young people is an, an extraordinary treasure that we will not in Congress allow to fade. Uh, I'm proud to join together with my colleagues in, uh, in, 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 in finding this uh, good compromise position which allows us to preserve the manned space program in a way that will uh, uh, fit within the existing uh, budget parameters. We've asked for a 30-day turnaround so the members of the Appropriations uh, Committee uh, can, can draft our bill to fit within the, the budget limitations and ensure that we uh, preserve and protect America's leadership role uh, in outer space. 
I was just going to say, if General Lee had had the high ground, there would have been a different turnout yeah, in the battle. True. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Absolutely. Thank you, John, for those comments. And just as someone who is in the Navy for just under 10 years, they teach you that from day one. He who controls the high ground controls the battle. And space is the ultimate high ground for the future conflicts our country's going to get in. And as we all know, we've gotten incredibly dependent on satellite technology, communications, our military in particular. One example, in my, the district I represent, Arlington Field, there's a group there, uh, the 147th Tactical Fighter Wing, flying Predator aircraft on missions over Iraq and Afghanistan. Houston, Texas being controlled out to Afghanistan real time. And our satellites, I mean, if something ever happens, then we lose our seniority in human space, our, our leadership. We lose those satellites, we're in big trouble. And, you know, something favorable for me is probably this thing, the Black Bear died. That, that's a good thing. But uh, just the point is, is our society has gotten incredibly dependent upon technology. Our military, our leadership, our military dominance depends on it. And we have to keep our leadership in space. And with that, we have one final person, the Honorable Bill Posey from Florida. Come on up here, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. I'm glad to join my colleagues here today. Um, what, what they're asking for is not something the administration does not understand. Uh, when the president was campaigning in my district, uh, he made the statement that he would close the space gap uh, between the shuttle and the, and the next uh, program, Constellation, and keep America first in space, meaning the military high ground that my colleagues have talked about. Uh, but obviously that's not what has happened. The gap has become eternal, and we may eternally yield the military high ground in our ability to transport our astronauts and the astronauts from other countries that we're obligated to transport back and forth to the space station. And by the way, I don't think there's anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, that thinks low Earth orbit exclusively is keeping America first in space. And so, uh, what I'm asking for here today, uh, joining my colleagues, is just asking the administration to keep its promise. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Now, I understand there's some secret new revelations to be brought forth that are promising about the future of space that will be announced on tax day back in my district, on April 15th. Very poor choice of days, in my opinion, but I don't make the president's schedule. But um, there's an old adage that goes... If you tell me a story once, fool me once, it's your fault. Well, we've made the gap eternal, we haven't shortened it. If you tell me a story twice, and I fall for it, it's my fault. But I'm giving the benefit of the doubt uh, that not being first in space uh, is number two. There's no reason for me to believe, or I think any other logical person, Promise number three, whatever that may be, if promises one and two aren't kept. Uh, so I thank you for the opportunity to address you today, and I thank my colleagues for uniting, and both sides of the aisle uniting on this in, in very important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And uh, I just want to follow up on Bill's comments and stress just what a bipartisan effort this is. I mean, we've got Gene Green here, and if you attended or listened to the hearings um, last week, if you just close your eyes and listen to what was being said, you couldn't have told, couldn't have decided who's a Republican, who's a Democrat. It's been a truly bipartisan effort. That's how we're going to defeat this. And with that, I want to thank you all for coming out.